about that the cheap um, were we've been together for about six months uh, started in the summer uh, we work in all cases digital and really uh, work deeply in, in analytics and, and customer data. Uh, been working a lot with, uh, with, uh, with different kinds of SSO platforms and the data that you get from, from uh, identified customers. And, and that's kind of like the main setup. We're uh, pretty deep in, in, in data, not only from the anal analysis perspective, but also the implementation part. And this is um, where, where the expertise, joint expertise of, of um, uh, say, uh, the developer approach also kicks in. So um, practically everybody uh, on board has been doing development work in, in uh, for, for myself, it's been like a pretty long time that I've really written any code, but, uh, but Jaakko and Henry are uh, active full stack developers and, and every one of us uh, knows code as well. So that's kind of part of our DNA and that can be seen in Jaakko's part of the presentation. So um, moving on to the presentation. Um, we're, we're going to speak about uh, video analytics and, uh, and how, how it's, uh, it's changing the way we see it and how it could change um, in the future. Uh, so three things. Uh, I'll start with explaining why video analytics is hard. The second part of the presentation talks to some of the points that Yali already mentioned about the pitfalls with traditional analytics vendors and thirdly uh, what you already talked about as well like how how things could be done differently in the future but starting off with uh, why video analytics is hard it's divided in three parts uh, firstly um, it's hard uh, because the measurement is primarily based on time that a user spends uh, watching a stream. So, and that means that it's not only uh, just like play events uh, that you need to track, but it's also uh, pause or play and pause sequences, uh, end events, scrubbing, so whenever the user grabs the playhead and, and starts looking for a segment of the video, and a combination of all these. Plus then the really hard part often is the so-called heartbeat measurement. So when somebody, you know, starts binging videos for the next three hours, the only like interaction that the user does is the first play event in the in the in the sequence of those like three one-hour videos. So what you need to be able to do is to send uh, at any given interval uh, information to the back end that the video is still running. So that's called a heartbeat. And if the user, for some, for some reason, for example, just uh, closes a browser um, mid-session uh, into the, like half an hour into the video, if you wouldn't be you know, sending out the heartbeat measurements, there's no way you would be able to tell from the analytics system that the user actually you know, sat down uh, and, and watched the video for, for, for 30 minutes. So that's why heartbeat is, is, a, is a crucial part of, of, uh, of video measurement. And, and, and that's why it's hard, because there's so much to measure in, 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 uh, in video overall. Um, another part, part why video analytics is hard is because the, the, the device landscape is just exploding. Um, it used to be very easy when you had you know, desktop, browser environment, few types of players out there, and, and that was it. Um, now you have tablets, you have smartphones, you have smart TVs, um, and you, I wouldn't call them smart TVs when you look inside. The firmware and everything is pretty, you know, it's nasty. So the really nasty platforms, especially for, for the video player measurement. Um, and, and, and soon you will be able to watch videos on your toasters and your refrigerators, whatever. So it's going to be just, you know, the problem is going to expand. And, and, and this is really hard from the perspective that, that you just need to, to test all the time and, and, uh, and have, have an understanding 
of you know where the glitches are if, if your uh, if your data is, is faulty. So that's why 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 it's it's also very hard. And and thirdly, it's it's hard because it all happens on client side basically. Um, the current paradigm is, is primarily that the, the measurement is happening on the client side. So from video perspective, uh, the player is just one part of the video experience. It's crucial to understand also what happens around the player. Say for example, you have a, a video platform, you do want to know what happens before the user starts the video. Or even further, you want to know that somebody visited the platform but didn't start the video. So why, why did that happen? And if you don't couple the two types of, of data, the streaming and the other usage and interaction data around the player, you're just missing out a lot. Um, and, and this is like, there are many video analytics platforms that are primarily based on the data that the streaming server is sending out. And this is something that's probably overlooked in, in many cases. Uh, so, so, um, so just keep that in mind if, if, you, if you start taking the leap and taking things to, to the next level. Um, and as, as, as we heard before, um, and this is where the, you know, the whole developer uh, thing kicks in, is that it's open source and, and it can be you know, tuned and tailored to your needs, which is, which is beautiful if you just know what you're doing. And, and secondly, um, the, the whole idea of, of, um, of flexible collection and engineering is, is always going to be there. And, and this is, um, th th of course, there are caveats to this. And, and, and one, one story that, that um, you know, um, can tell about that is, is when Jaco and myself worked together on on a, um, uh, on a, let's say, a custom collector based on, on, on Amazon Cloud, where, uh, where Yaku actually built um, a custom-made collector based on, on, the, uh, on his own work. Uh, and we, we, we tried it out. This was uh, for the video analytics. Um, and, uh, and there was a, a, a collector built on, on uh, AWS. And then um, it was bolted on the, the whole data coming in for a Finnish broadcasting company, um, the video player ecosystem. And, and then the timing was such that um, uh, most of well, the Finns here know what's the, um, the most watched TV show in Finland. And that happens to be um, the... Um, Independence, Independence Day celebrations in the presidential palace, where basically the whole country is watching, you know, a few thousand people celebrate the independence in the in the castle, and and just shaking hands. It's crazy, but that's the way it is. So when the when the show starts, uh, you know, 6 p.m., everybody is watching it. Literally, it's it's like crazy. And what that means is that when 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 the show starts, it means that the video platform is getting like really heavy hitting. And, and funnily enough, uh, even though um, Yaka and the team had been preparing for that, it just so happened that, that at the peak, when the, when the show started and everybody you know, ran and watched the player, we had over uh, 100 servers running simultaneously, taking in all the traffic at Amazon Cloud. And it still wasn't enough. So basically, the, the learning from, from that was that, you know, um, it was a, in a big picture, it was a minor glitch. But had we had at that time uh, all this technology helping us, we, you know, we might have gotten through it in, in like a, in a, in a um, like gracefully. But uh, we had a few, few late night calls and chats that, that night, but uh, all in all, it went, went okay. But, but just to, to point out that, that you know, even though you can write everything yourself, it's not always basically 
uh, a good idea. So, so uh, y use uh, ready-made stuff when you can, obviously. And, and lastly, uh, the storage options, the third point of, of, of how, how these things should, should be used in the future. So if, if you can, um, always think about and, and, uh, and look ahead where you want to store the data. What are the components that you need to use in the cloud platform? Um, and Yako is going to tell a lot more about that regarding uh, uh, the POC that, that, uh, that he's been working on. Uh, so you get to pick and choose, and that's a wonderful thing. So you're not forced to, to uh, you know, take the whole, whole thing uh, from the storage perspective into use when you start doing things the, the new way, so to speak. So that was my part of the, um, of the presentation. Moving on to, to, uh, to Jaakko now. I've been working quite a long time with analytics and I wanted to come up with a case that I like, haven't been able to, to do with the traditional web analytics tools. And real-time video analytics was one. Like most of the web analytics vendors offer like daily, monthly or weekly reports, but it's impossible to do like real-time stuff that updates like uh, with a delay of, of a minute or even less. Um, in the past, I've done like uh, stuff that queries the APIs and take like like what are the most watched videos in this platform, and then you can make a like list sorted on that. But usually, that like updates once in an hour or a couple of times a day or or something like this. So, if you wanted to make like a website that shows concurrent uh, watchers or viewers, like uh, Twitch.tv does. Uh, you can see that the games are ordered by the number of viewers, like the day that I took this screenshot, World of Warcraft had the most viewers and was like ranked number one on the, on the browsers, on the games uh, list. And then there's a uh, crazy good game called IRL, that was fifth there, and in the IRL there were many streams. They were also ordered by the number of viewers, like this has uh, 4,000 viewers and this has 3,500 and so on. So the whole like, idea or the whole UI of Twitch.tv is based on uh, like sorting the, the streams uh, in real time. And next, uh, like I would like to tell you what I learned uh, on this experiment and how I did it. But before that, let's look at the numbers. So we have a lot of playing users now, and uh, the scale is on, on 20, so about 20 people playing. Good job! <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll, I'll go through the whole pipeline, how, how this thing works. And uh, pretty much first thing that happens is that the browser loads Google Tag Manager. And I have to admit that I don't know what the Google Tag Manager is running because Simo did all the code there. But it hooks up to the YouTube player uh, and the events that the player is, is giving out. So these playing, unstarted, ended, paused, queued, buffering, not loaded, etc. And it passes those to the Snowplow, tra Snowplow Tracker. And there are, the Snowplow has multiple trackers. Uh, and we're using the JavaScript tracker, which makes the most sense in a browser environment. And yeah, it, we use it to, or anybody would use it to uh, send the events from the browser to the Snowplow collector, which uh, we are running in, in Amazon EC2. Uh, just having a one instance there collecting the data that has been sent by the uh, by the tracker. Oops, I think I have a typo there. It says by the collector. Well, um, and there are many, or I think there are three different collectors available uh, in the Snowplow stack, and we use the Scala stream collector uh, because that is, is a good way to get the data fast and push it to Kinesis stream. And Kinesis is just a AWS service. 
uh, that you can use to like move the data from one service to another in a, in a streaming fashion so it goes very fast and you don't need to wait for an hour or so. Um, and in the Snowplow collector terminology it's a sink where, where the data is sent. And then the stream is being read by Snowplow Enricher with, which uh, validates and enriches the data. Um, we're not actually enriching the data in any way, but if, I, if we had like some metadata about the video, like who made it or when it was published or some kind of categories or whatever, we could, for example, enrich them here in the enricher. And we are using a service called Stream Enrich, and basically the or why we're using it, we're converting the data to JSON, which can then be used later on. And the next step is to push it to Kinesis Stream again. So it's just the same stuff that moved the data between collector and enricher, but now we're uh, moving it between enricher and the Kinesis Analytics. And the Kinesis Analytics is, uh, is a service where you can run SQL queries on the stream data. And that was like something we really wanted to try in this proof of concept because none of us had used it for anything. Uh, but I'll tell a little bit more about that soon. Uh, the next step after the Kinesis Analytics is the AWS Lambda, uh, which is basically function as a service in, in the cloud. And we're just using it to uh, write the late, latest uh, data from the stream to S3. And S3 is, as many of you probably know, it's a, just a file storage, like an FTP server, where we store the latest aggregated data. Um, so yeah, um, maybe I should say one more word about the Kinesis Analytics, that that is actually the part where we like uh, aggregate all the rows of events uh, to the different groups. What happened to the computer? Oh, well. Um, but yeah, uh, then how did it all go, like in retrospective? Um, this is an interesting setup because the, the, the history of the data is, is not stored. Like there's only the, the latest value, but the history is not stored. There's no database, uh, nothing like that but still it works. And the, the data has delay of about two minutes. That was kind of what I was hoping for, but we also had a setup where the delay was about 20 seconds, but it had some issues, so we didn't end up using that one. But it would be really nice to uh, get a solution with the like 20 second delay. Um, and you can also always argue like, uh, what is real time and what is not. Like today there was a, a guy talking to me that they're doing real time uh, analytics streaming at the moment and then I asked like what is real time for you and he said like 24 hours it is, is real time. So yeah. <laughs> so two minutes is not that bad. Um, but yeah, the, some of the issues that, that I wanted to talk about, especially with the Kinesis analytics, is that we just wanted to like, take the data out of Kinesis Analytics and save it to S3. And Lambda seemed to be pretty much the only way to do this. But we had so much issues. Uh, we tried to debug with, with Simo how to get this working right. Like there were many instances, like we were getting the data in our debuggers, everything seemed great. But then on the website there was uh, wrong and different data. And it seemed to be that the, the Lambda is running the Lambda is getting like wrong input for no reason, even though the Kinesis Analytics has like the correct output. So we're still like trying to solve what happened with that. And the whole um, like idea with Kinesis Analytics sounds great. Like you can easily aggregate and like do magic stuff on streams, but then it like follows this 
paradigm of software and as an SQL, uh, which means like you can write like awesome software in SQL, like thousand lines of SQL, and it will do wonderful things. But if you need to test it or debug it, <laughs> it's it's a nightmare to like maintain. So the same issue will come eventually with Kinesis Analytics that it's not the like, best way to develop software, I think. And one of the nice things uh, with this setup was the snowplow collector. What Levi said earlier, we had some some issues developing our own collector in the past, so I was really keen on like checking what all the fe features are in the snowplow collector and how they work. And I was happy, like like it had buffering uh, before data was sent to Kinesis streams, and, and a lot of the features that like we had learned that you need to have in the collector. So that really made life easy and, and like setting up the collector needed like three or three to five minutes of configuration and was really a nice process compared to the like three or five months of coding that I did with the previous collector and losing like a lot of data in the process. But yeah, that's about it. I hope you have some questions about the setup. I will Leave it there to give you some inspiration. So, questions, comments? Yeah, go ahead. So, the question is that have we tried uh, loading it to Kinesis Firehose before the Lambda? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, I have to admit that that's how it's working at the moment. Okay. Uh, but we're like using the Lambda before the Kinesis Firehose uh, to transform the data and then as a side effect it's, it's like pushing it to the S3. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, that, that was like our first like idea, maybe, maybe yours as well, like that's how it should work. You put it to Firehose and then it, from Firehose you can put it to S3 or something like this. But if you do that, then you'll have a like different file for like each of the data points or each of the stream updates, and then it's pretty hard to integrate it to the website. So you'll have all the data in the S3, which is what you what we wanted here, but it would be in a wrong like format or it wouldn't be in a very usable way in the S3. Should we also like in picture like after S3? Well, it's not really a question. Uh, go ahead. Not a question about, yeah. Okay, you could use like enricher after the S3? Was that? Yeah, why do you need this enricher before the Ah, like, yeah. why is this? Yeah. Uh, because of the third point. It converts the data from this format called thrift, um, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, to JSON. And Isn't thrift like, like uh, what, what is that? Yeah, I'm not qualified to answer that. Thing. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> I thought it was like a server. Well, I never heard of Thrift. Yeah, I had not heard of Thrift uh, either, but I heard the enricher can convert to JSON, so I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a serialization, like the app, like the alternative app, right? Any other questions? Um, how much does it cost to run this setup with our um, enough visitors so they broke your computer? <laughs> the, the data is still out there somewhere, but do you have an estimate of the cost of this pipeline? So Simo asked if we have an estimate how much this costs. And I don't. I never go to the billing section of AWS. <laughs> I have a very specific question, because I've been thinking also in the presentation. It was about this easy to instance and the auto scale. Okay, so there was a question about EC2 instances and order scaling. Yeah, so, so, so it's like a fit, like a really good fit for all purposes because we have some really like high speaks, for example, uh, peaks. Uh, sorry, not speaks, but peaks <laughs> in our data. So with EC2, it would seem like okay, maybe you have a problem because you need to start up an instance. Yes. So is the order scaling like 
answer to uh, big peaks in, in the usage. And like at least my experience with Snowplow is that you would have to implement that yourself. Uh, but yeah, Yali, if you have a better knowledge. Yes, you, we, scale, we scale each of the apps. So the most important one to scale is the collector. So if that doesn't scale up fast enough, you have data <coughs> loss. So that scales, uh, we, we set, so this would be part of an auto scaling group with a load balancer on, in front. And it would be set to scale very aggressively. So we often it's scaling, it doesn't really need to. It scales if the CPU utilization hits 40%. It scales if the response time starts looking a bit dodgy. Any, anything starts to look shaky, it needs to scale because it takes a few minutes to yeah, spin up new instances. And so those deep spikes matter. With the rest of the pipeline, we're scaling based on the whole topology. So there's a ratio of streams to enrichers to sinks and so on. And so that's that's quite complicated. Um, yeah, just about the first. It's just about the collector, yeah, because yeah, that you just it's just latency, but the collector's data loss. So. Yeah, the collector is the most important part, and you have to uh, like do it on your own by setting up the rules in AWS. Any other questions? So one uh, one. The thing that we're having trouble with in video analytics is, of course, the uh, distribution of different player software. So all the media companies might be employing their own player software, and then the um, individual um, video providers might have their own player software. And some of those just simply don't provide an API for the client. So we don't, we don't have a JavaScript API that will let us go to the level of detail that YouTube, for example, lets us tap into. So how would Snowplow, for example, solve that problem because that, I think that is the, there's a, the, the problems with video analysis like we were talking about coming like twofold. So we have the fact that we have lots of media measurement companies measuring things in a bit different way, which is basically a question about conventions and how we approach sometimes standardization. And the other problem is the distribution of devices and, and, and players themselves. So is Snowplow something that could help with this? Because here we are describing a, an end-to-end -end pipeline from the client all the way to the warehouses. But could Snowplow be basically, could it be implemented to accept service like just to server to server data, for example, log, parsing logs from those video? Yeah, it's <laughs> difficult to, to measure all the client side stuff because of different devices, different environments. And you might not have the, the proper like collectors or proper bindings in the in the players and so on. So could this be solved on the server side? So I think the answer is yes, in, in a way that there's the CDN collector that you could use to uh, to track uh, how many or how much the the videos have been downloaded from the content delivery network. And if you combine that with the data that you're actually collecting from uh, the front ends, then you'll probably have uh, some kind of useful data. But uh, uh, that's something I really would like to try out in the future, and I can't say that it will work, but something that I'd be interested in. Questions, comments? Yeah, we have here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey. Snowplow uh, answered to the question that Tag Manager tries to solve. So. Because one, one thing we've been thinking about is to have a tech management system which you can integrate into different uh, devices, like mobile clients and Yeah, yeah. So, so how to get like a... have the solution for that as well. Yeah, so how, how, is there a tag manager that would work on a mobile devices and, and all kinds of devices? And as far as I know, the answer is no. And that's why we use the Google Tag Manager. So the, the the benefit of using a tag manager at this point is that it's basically a UI for developing a JavaScript tracking ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you have a, a single like backdoor to the website with a JavaScript injector and then you can use the UI to add stuff to it. Well, I mean, Snowplow doesn't have that. Um, I don't think, I'm not sure. What the Snowplow tracker probably could exhibit in the, in the future, if it doesn't already do that, is have like auto event tra automatic event tracking for interactions, same way that Facebook does, for example, with their SDK. But 
shouldn't you switch uh, this Azure development to this kind of document <laughs> system development? I mean, to do you think there's a feature? Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think needs to be developed? Like, if you would have a lot of people or companies already thinking about that management systems or how to distribute the SDKs or whatever you want in different client devices. But there's no solution. So like here you use GTM for example, but you could use something like then Cyclon or something else. <coughs> similar, but you could have them use it in more wide area of uh, devices. But just for So do you think that, uh, just an interesting thought. So do you think like uh, there's demand for, uh, let's say you have a, a snowplow tracker in JavaScript, and then you would build a, a, an SDK for mobile, for, for uh, iOS and for Android, and you could have a UI where we just, where you would, like GTN, you could specify which events, and it would generate the tracker dynamically based yeah. on this. Yeah, something like that, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. It depends, like, do you, like, is snowplow going to become the, the, because I think for a snowplow it's still, the benefit of a tech management system is that you can use the same data limit, for example, to send information to multiple vendors, and then use to distribute the same information to Google and to uh, Hotjar and whatever. And I think. You know, for